Watch out, there's a new dock on the block. Did you miss me? He might look different, he might sound different. Fantastic. But when it comes to time travel, he's the same old doctor. Different. New, new doctor. <laughs> it's a doctor's life for David Tennant, and he's the perfect ten. Uh. Hello. It's summer 2005, and the Doctor Who team are battling with the elements to film the opening scene of the brand new series. The script has this in mind as, a, as an idyllic place with sunshine and glistening sea and several planets over the horizon. And as luck would have it, we're here on a day where the wind is blowing 4-7 and we're probably going to have to do all the sound in post. Um, at the very top, <laughs> can you just imagine the shuttle going over? Yeah. So I'll do a... We're arriving on New Earth, which is the Gower Peninsula near Swansea, and uh, it's blowing a gale. Action! What's the city called? New New York. Come on. <laughs> it's just a face full of hair. <laughs> we were supposed to be here slightly earlier in the summer, and uh, various shooting schedule things meant that we're a bit late, so it's a little bit more wintry than intended, but. Uh, once the computer people have fiddled about with it, it's going to look extraordinary, I'm told. I wanted a bit of spectacle, a bit of size and colour. New New York in episode one has a retro 1930s feel to it, as well as being a bit sci-fi, because it is the first time we're going to an alien planet. It's the first time David Tennant's doctor has taken Rose Tyler anywhere. I'm sure he's going out to impress it. Apple grass. Apple grass. Yeah, yeah. I'm the doctor. Still not it. I'm the new boy, you know, so you do feel that there's an awful lot to live up to now. <laughs> It's really exciting to know that he's going to step onto the set. Two hearts! And surprise us. Oh, baby, I'm beating out a samba! It's good fun to sort of be on set with them all and we're, we're, we're having a laugh. Yeah. I think there's a huge scale to this series. I think our stories are bigger this year. Expectations are higher because you have to match or better what you've done before. We knew we'd set a benchmark. We had to at least meet it, if not exceed it, for people to say, OK, yeah, it's still working, they can do it more than once. So we are making a show about somebody who travels through time in a police box. It's a bit like a fairground ride, right? it's great fun. So it would be... It would be a shame not to enjoy that. Can I just say, travelling with you, I love it. Me too. <laughs> Come on! It is terrifying uh, to go from a series one that has been so successful into a second series. The focus is, is sort of very much week by week on making every script good. That's how we made the first series, and that's how we carry on making the second series, is just say, let's make it good. The first challenge was to fill the hole left by Chris Eccleston, who handed over his sonic screwdriver at the end of series one. It was very scary, because we had got one of the best actors in the land, and you don't want the programme to take a step down. Before I go, I just want to tell you, you were fantastic. So there are very, very few actors on that list, to be honest, of proper leading men. And you know what? So was I. Chris set the bar as high as it could possibly be and then in regenerating the doctor you need to find an actor who's every bit as good we got to david tennant quite quickly because russell t davis and i had worked with him on casanova where he'd been extraordinary oh, 
more than a doctor, sir. You're a miracle worker. Behold! <laughs> You know, it wasn't pre-planned, but it was like everything just happening to be in the right place at the right time. He was just the right age, the right kind of sensibility. I didn't get a call about the part. I was actually I was sitting with, with uh, Russell T. Davis and Julie Gardner at the time, and they just sort of brought it up. I was dying to be the one to ask him, and Julie actually came in with it and said it. It's like, I was, damn, <laughs> I wanted to be the one. It was a fairly surreal moment. And I just laughed, really. He just burst out laughing. He literally gave the big, threw his head back and gave the biggest laugh. It just felt like a fairly impossible prospect. It was very exciting. And I hummed and hawed about it for a few days. I, I, I wondered if really it was, the, it was the right thing to do. And then I just woke up one morning and went, don't be ridiculous, you couldn't, you couldn't walk away from this. You, you, You'd never forgive yourself. This is an opportunity that you never dreamed would happen, and it's, uh, it's a show I've always loved, so I've got, to, I've got to do this. Even if I fall flat on my face, I've got to give it a go. The next thing he said was, I want a coat down to there. And he pointed at his ankle, and we just went, oh, there we are, we got him. <laughs> and it was the doctor's new clothes that would make David's arrival complete. It's about marking a difference between the ninth doctor and the tenth. How's David travelling? With the tenth doctor, we've gone a little bit further. It's a bit more stylised. It's the pinstripe suit, it's the big coat. This is it. This is the new look. Gosh, like picking out frocks at the RSC, isn't it? I think there's a bit of a tradition to it, really, that, you know, the, of the doctor rattling through uh, clothes rails looking for something. That's great, because then you're bigger in frame there. Right. Yes. And then moving away, and then moving away, that. moving away. That's great. So that's the closest, and then we start to yeah, reveal it. Yeah, that's great. When you pull bits, <laughs> thank you. I think it's always been a big moment in Doctor Who when the Doctor uh, chose his clothes and decided how he was going to look. And so I think Russell was very keen that we did the same. That might work. Right from the word go, we loved the sort of studenty idea of the suit with the plimsolls and stuff like that. We just handed it over. David went off with Louise. And freedom, freedom is absolutely the key to it. From the initial trying on session, I think by the end of sort of two hours, we roughly knew where we were heading with the costumes. We had pretty much decided we wanted a suit, and David and I both knew straight away that narrow shapes suited him and narrow trouser legs suited him. I'm thrilled that people like it, and, and more importantly, the actor's comfortable wearing in it, because at the end of the day, for me, that's really the most important thing. That's just, yeah, that's an absolute moment where we're thinking, what's that? With David's arrival eagerly anticipated, it was several months before he could finally set foot in the TARDIS. It did feel at one point that it was never, like, it was never going to start. There was a big old lead-up to, to this, you know, and so much sort of press and so much kind of uh, speculation about it that it's, it, it's a relief to finally get on set and to finally be doing it. The production team kept the filming under wraps, for a few months at least. There were two secret bits of filming. Uh, so the first was when we shot Christopher Eccleston and Billy Piper and their big farewell. But it's a bit dodgy, this process. You never know what you're going to end up with. Don't stay away! We shot uh, Chris's side of things. because when we shot that, we hadn't yet cast David. I'm not going to see you again. Not like this. Not with this daft old face. And so we shot the David Tennant lines much later on. So where was I? Oh, that's right. Barcelona. David was smuggled in in April, I think, just on his own, uh, to shoot those just those few shots of him. New teeth. That's weird. I was dying to go because I thought that's a bit of history, really. But I thought, oh God, he's 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 having to regenerate in that leather jacket. It's uh, you don't want a thousand eyes staring at you because he's got enough of that to come. Very scary, I'm sure, for him. Uh, very few people around, so it was kind of weird experience of dipping his toe into being Doctor Who and the madness and the bigness of the show, but in a very small, controlled way. <laughs> Regeneration's amazing. I mean, I have to say, the people that came up with Regeneration are geniuses. It's the one thing that's ensured the Doctor Who stays alive. It's what's made it the world's longest-running science fiction show. You just, you can replace your lead actor, which means it just keeps on going. 
mean, it's just the best device, and I think every returning series should have a mechanism like that. With this regeneration, we just want to make it big and volcanic and exciting. It's sort of in keeping with everything we've done with the show. Hello. I wanted a big trauma in the regeneration. I think I think it's, it's quite odd if you change your entire body. That's like having huge, life-changing surgery and then getting up straight away. You won't be out too soon. I'm still regenerating. I'm bursting with energy. There's a sense of mourning with Rose when the Doctor changes, which, again, I think is important to, to take all these science fiction ideas and treat them as real, I, I mean, emotionally real. I thought I knew him, Mum. And then he goes in this thing. The doctor wouldn't do this. The old doctor, the proper doctor, he'd wake up. I think she maybe got closer to the doctor than most of his other companions ever could have done. So she's really in mourning for a, a dead friend, almost a dead boyfriend. The doctor's gone. He, he left me up. He left me up. And I will try <laughs> to fix you. Regeneration is quite traumatic for a viewer. And I remember when I was young, when, when John Pertwee changed into Tom Baker, you didn't like it. You automatically didn't like the fact that your doctor had changed. Look, Brigadier, look. I think it's starting. That ownership is a good thing. It makes you sort of latch onto the programme a bit more than if it was any old science fiction programme. Here we go again. I think maybe the most interesting regeneration um, is the very first one. Obviously, nobody knew what was happening. You, you've got the real mystery of what is happening to our hero. But the interesting thing about the first regeneration is that the new Doctor, Patrick Troughton, is kind of on the ball from the first second. The answer is simple. A severe drop in the carbon dioxide level in the lower, lower atmosphere. Whereas later on, there'd always be a period of, of weirdness. How are you feeling? Shoes. I beg your pardon. The doctor wouldn't know where he was. The square on the other part of music was the sum of the square on the other two sides. Who he was, what was going on. Who am I? Who am I? And who are you? Why is a mouse when it spins? What would you do if you were me? What happened? Ah, who's that? Be like a sort of little fluffy chick in need of mothering. The doctor's very strange. She's weak, it's the shock. What would I do if I were me? You had another if you fit. That's you, Doctor. I don't have fits. The explosion must have caused me to regenerate. Often he'd be manic. Doctor, are you sure you're well? Of course. Fit as a trombone. Fiddle. This is work for heroes, not for faint-hearted girls. A lot of times it was fun to see how the companions dealt with the new Doctor. Where's the Doctor? What have you done with her? Stay away from me! What have you done with yeah. the Doctor? There are eyes and ears, and they were the ones we already knew. Have you the faintest idea what you look like? Oh, my outward appearance is of no importance whatsoever. Well, it is to me. I have to live with it. As much as they were meeting the new Doctor, so were we. But who is he? Where's the Doctor? That's him. What do you mean, that's the Doctor? Doctor who? When he's not there, it's interesting to see how the other characters don't quite know how to function without him. Don't you dare. Someone's got to be the doctor. They'll kill you. Never stopped him. Nobody quite knows how to react. Nobody quite knows what to do. Even Rose, you know, his best friend who he's really taught, she has no idea what to do. Now leave this planet in peace! It was very important to give Rose a big story and then to write an episode in which you were dying for the doctor to wake up. And he really doesn't appear until about 40 minutes into it. Did you miss me? It was important to do that, to, to, to put the doctor up. As, as an icon, to put him as an icon, to give him his proper status as a hero, and then have David walk through the TARDIS doors, and he does save the world with a Satsuma. No second chances. He brings down a government with six words. Don't you think she looks tired? He makes everyone else fall in love with him. <laughs> and then he has Christmas. <laughs> oh, that's yours. Oh. It's an extraordinary 15 minutes for a character to go through that. But I think you have to love him at the end of that. So just how different will this new Doctor be to his past incarnation? Everyone has sort of said, you know, how is your Doctor going to be different? How are you going to... Uh, uh, what are you going to bring to it? And I think it's, it's very... 
I think it's very difficult and quite misleading to be too categorical about that before you start. Um, because the scripts are what you've got to go on, and they're always what you've got to come back to. I feel very much as though I carry on writing more or less the same Doctor, because he is the same man, and he, he fills the same space within the drama, and, and, and with actors that good, as good as Chris and as good as David, what you're really doing is leaving a blank space so that um, they can fill it. Obviously, what you bring to it is yourself, and that happens for free. You know, you don't have any choice about that. He's a very different man, because he's being played by a different man, and David brings a completely different energy to it. So where are we going? Further than we've ever gone before. I think he's probably a more verbal doctor. Strictly speaking, it's the 15th New York since the original. He's got very big, lengthy speeches, lots of runs of words. So that makes it new, 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 new York. He's quite chaotic. <laughs> Um, he's very energetic. How was I, how was I? There are flashes of darkness to the character. What's the turnover? Hmm? A thousand a day, a thousand the next, a thousand the next. How many thousand? For how many years? How many? And so there's a lot of kind of lulling an audience into him being a lovely, kind of interesting, fascinating character. And then you absolutely see what the moral line is. I'm the doctor. And if you don't like it, if you want to take it to a higher authority, there isn't one. It stops with me. He has to be a good guy. He has to be heroic. He has to be um, morally impregnable. We can't let a single particle of disease get out. There is 10 million people in that city. They'd all be at risk. Now turn that off! Not if it gets me out. All right, fine. So I have to stop you lot as well. And beyond that, it is a kind of, it's a kind of evolving thing. But, but ultimately, the script is always what you've got to go on, you know. If I suddenly decided I want to play it with a, with a, with a limp, uh, and, uh, and the script had me running up and down corridors, then that's not going to work, you know. All the scripts in series two bring their own new challenge, but as always, every scene in every episode takes months of planning and dozens of personnel to make Doctor Who reach new heights. We're doing a sequence in the lift shaft in the hospital on New New Earth. There's the moment where the Doctor and Rose first arrive in the building, walk into the lifts. Ward 26, thanks. And this postmodern disinfection sequence happens. Hold on! Hold on! Oh, too late. I'm going up. All right, there's another lift. Which, of course, the Doctor knows all about, and Rose doesn't. Watch out for the disinfectant. For the what? The disinfectant. The what? The di oh, you're It means that both Billy and David have to get soaking wet, uh, covered in talc, and blown dry several times. Yeah, whistling in the shower, go on. The first time we did it, it was great, because the water was all warm and lovely, but with every successive take, it's getting colder and colder as they uh, refill the tank in a hurry. Cut! Yeah. Cut! Thank you. I can hear what you were saying, James. It's all right, love, it was fine. <laughs> was it? <laughs> It's quite a silly thing to do, really, to stand in your clothes and get soaking. It was a lot wetter than I was expecting. If you just run the dryer on it a bit, you know, we've got 10 to 15 before they're ready with wind. And then if he is a bit drier than he is now, that's good. The coat is, um, it does suck up the water, rather. So, it, yeah, it's a bit of a dead weight. So, yeah, it's quite, it's quite heavy. And the, the, the jacket... The kind of material that the, the, the suit is, it, it, it gets, it's very difficult to take, take it on and, on and off when it's soaking wet. So the, the really nice experience is when you've been soaking, you take it off and you open another take and you have to put the jacket back on again. It's slipping into a wetsuit feeling, you know, it's uh, challenging. But I'm coping rather well, I feel. I think sequences like this are a particular nightmare for makeup and costume because um, they've got to get you back to the, you know, the way you were before you were deluged with torrential downpour of water. So uh, it's probably most high maintenance for them, I think. Well, the challenge for us is to work out which sequence to shoot it in. Because every time they get wet, they've got to be dried again. Every time they get covered in powder, or the set gets covered in powder, we've got to clean it up again. Wind. We think we've got a plan to reduce the amount of time we spend waiting for the artist to be cleaned or for the lift to be cleaned. If we've got it wrong, the schedule goes down the pan. Action, Billy. Go <laughs> two. And trying to switch it off. 
The great thing about Billy and David is they are so game for the adventure of filmmaking, as much as they are as characters game for the adventure of space travel. Cut! Cut! <laughs> You're right, <in> there. <laughs> you know, David comes bouncing onto set every day. Oh. My old company. Yeah. Yeah. God, I hope he's doing it nine months into the whole shoot. Spa treatment's no required. Billy is there working at heights, happy to have her wire on, her harness on, everything you saw in series one, she's doing again now. Um, covered in paint, covered in water. They seem to just take it in their stride. The mind of Russell T. Davis is a very strange and curious place, and it conjures up these extraordinary, uh, these extraordinary scenarios, which we get the great joy of acting out. <laughs> it's a hoot. Amidst all the fun on New Earth, there's the return of one old face, Peekaboo, to keep the Doctor and Rose on their toes. I thought it would be a good idea to have a recurring villain from who, who everyone had enjoyed last year. I'm drying out. Oh, oh, sweet heavens. Moisturize me. Moisturize me. I am too young. I was very aware that, again, as uh, there will be some younger audience still sitting there saying, that's not my doctor, and he's a different man. I saw it. <laughs> you got ripped apart. Moisturize me. Moisturize me. So that there's just a bit of continuity, just to smooth it over. That piece of skin was taken from the front of my body. This piece is the back. <laughs> right, so you're talking out your... Ask not. I also wanted to do a story with the body swapping. It's a chance for the Doctor to be funny. Open it! Not till you get out of her. We need the Doctor. I order you to leave her! I always sort of said you don't have to impersonate her. You have to be a Rose version of Cassandra and a Doctor version of Cassandra and that their essence is still in them. <laughs> No matter how difficult the situation, there is no need to shout. And also a chance for the rose to be funny. Curse. Oh, baby. It's like living inside a bouncy castle. Billy and David both do it brilliantly. I mean, they took enough of Cassandra's traits, uh, inspired by the performance that Zoe Wanamaker had already given to Cassandra. Ooh. The body language changes, the voice changes. Oh, my God. I'm a champ. The whole expression of Billy's face changes. Lady killer. And she becomes this a pouting, flirtatious, terrifying female creature. Who are you? The last human. Cassandra. Wake up and smell the perfume. Oh. Billy does it so brilliantly for quite a long time, and then... So I don't think you're then expecting that the Doctor will get possessed too. It's an homage to Ms. Wanamaker, and I think she'll be, she'll be proud. Cassandra? Goodness me, I'm a man. Young. <laughs> I hope she will. She'll probably murder me the next time she sees me. So many parts, and hardly used. It also ups the stakes of the episode. It's quite, you know, in, in, in dramatic terms, it's, it's quite important that, that she can do this, and that, and that she's, she, she refuses to die. I can't Adam and Eve it. What what's what's with the voice? With the kiss between um, the Cassandra Rose and the Doctor, any sort of lip-to-lip -lip contact with the Doctor gets enormously exaggerated, and people say, "Oh, the program's changed. It's the death of Doctor Who." I just sat there thinking, "Well, have I been trapped in a frame as Cassandra has for a couple of thousand years? If I suddenly got a body and a very sexy body with Rose Tyler's body, I'd want to snog someone. Frankly, it's and she can't bear the Doctor. He killed her." But nonetheless, he's there, he's handsome, she has a bit of it. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> so the Doctor's back with a new face, a new suit, and a whole new set of adventures with Rose that looks set to be bigger and better than ever. It's lovely to come back in and do a second series of something that's been a hit. You're sitting around the table saying to people, look, just hold the line and give us, you know, another uh, series of episodes that are just as good as that. At the end of the day, all you do is try to tell the best stories written by the best people, cast in the best way that you can, and you try at all costs to put as much money on screen as you can. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. Are we in Scotland? Oh, guys! No, don't do that. Master, you recognises me! I'm a different...
form of address is your majesty. Never mind what came before, never mind what's coming after. Make this 45 minutes good, and then you're on a winner. The last doctor was possibly the greatest doctor that we had ever seen. Hello, Sarah Jane. This guy, <laughs> David, is just... He's great, man. I think we may, we may have a new winner. Jelena Jolie is with us on Monday, not sitting on my lap like I wish, but in the movie Tomb Raider, that's on Monday at 8.30 on BBC Three. Next tonight, it's The Apprentice.